am very proud to welcome Peter Grayson to give our presentation today on an overview of psychedelics. And I'm going to let him um, introduce himself. He is the founder and principal of the Flow Initiative. And I'm going to let him take it from there to let us know exactly what that is a bit. Well, thanks, Darcy. And thank you to the Root Center for having me. And thank you, everyone, for coming, taking the time out to, to be here. Um, I am Peter Grayson. I'm a licensed clinician. I've been practicing psychedelic assisted therapy for uh, and, and coaching for approximately seven years or so. Um, I'll get into a little bit more of that um, in a moment or two. Um, but before I get into that, if I could ask everyone to turn on your cameras for just a sec, I want to see a show of hands. And who has any experience or exposure prior to psychedelic medicine, psychedelic assisted therapy, um, or is this your first time learning anything about it or you know, your first foray into it? So kind of show of hands, has anybody had any experience whatsoever or had any, or done any research, Googling or, or any background at all? Youth uh, research, so to speak, but not clinical practice. All right, so seeing a few hands, but not too many, which is great, um, which kind of helps me set the context a little bit. Um, also feel free as we're going along, I'm gonna open up the chat um, and I will do my best to answer questions as we go along. Um, and I would love it to be as interactive as possible. Um, this is kind of, you know, it, it's not entirely new space and a new field because it really, you know, is kind of a continuation of a lot of research work um, that was done stemming back, you know, to the 1940s, 1950s, um, you know, the golden era in the 50s, 60s, early 70s until, um, you know, the proverbial drug war shut everything down. Um, so, you know, it, it's not entirely new practice um, and new material, but it's kind of a new resurgence, new applications, and certainly a new body of research that we're going to be talking about. Um, so that being said, just going to share a screen in a sec, and um, we'll go from here. So bear with me. And can everybody see okay? It's a nod of heads real quick. All right. Yes. So this is the introduction to psychedelic assisted therapy. Um, quick disclaimer, I'm not an MD. You know, I am essentially the lowest hanging fruit uh, on the clinical tree and totem pole. Um, I've been really a frontline clinician for over a dozen years. Specialty and training and background is in addiction treatment. Uh, for a number of years after entering into practice, which was really a, a second chapter career for myself, um, I ended up becoming a little disillusioned and, and would even consider myself a, a recovering clinician because uh, the constraints on clinical practice, specifically with substance use disorders, uh, are very tight very tight box, you know, especially back then, one size fits all approach was very dominant. A lot of the concentric systems supporting treatment from criminal justice, third party reimbursement, all kind of followed that same model. And at the same time, a lot of, you know, traction was being developed around, you know, what was then called alternative practices, smart recovery, even other things evolving, um, which kind of spun me out of the box a little bit. Um, over the years, I've certainly leaned back into the clinical world, certainly with the legitimization of psychedelic medicine. And I think it's important to kind of stick to that lane, uh, but also important to recognize and acknowledge, you know, I am not an MD. Um, and there are a tremendous amount of MDs and far more credentialed individuals whose shoulders I'm really standing on, um, have been inspired by, have been taught by, and who know a tremendous amount more than I do. Um, so I just wanna keep that in context. Um, also, this is not an endorsement in any way of illegal substance use in any form or practice. Um, 
or really kind of a DIY approach to any of this. Um, and lastly, I have no financial interests, no affiliations with, with any uh, financial stakes in any of this. Um, this is purely, you know, uh, kind of a little bit of a, and I'll get into this in a moment, but really a, an intersection of, of personal meets passion, because uh, as I mentioned, this is a second chapter career for me and what brought me into it was my own need. Um, I, I struggled with mental health disorders, substance abuse issues for many, many years. Uh, I was fortunate enough to get some help about 15 years ago uh, and was inspired you know, to go back to school, uh, want to give the help that I received. Um, and, and then that really set a very kind of personal compass where, because you know, I don't want to in any way transfer my recovery or, or my journey on anybody else. Um, but at the same time, the recognition of what I went through uh, certainly inspired me um, to kind of set that. So that's it about me a little bit. Um, a little bit about today. Um, we just did the introduction, but going to kind of break out this presentation into three main parts. Um, the first being just kind of general set and setting. Um, the second part being what the real healing journey looks like, what it consists of. And the third part, what is the landscape that's constantly evolving um, look like? Uh, and then we'll wrap it up with questions. But as I said earlier, you know, always, well, actually, I should back up. Now that I'm sharing the screen, I can't see the Q&A. So I apologize. Uh, scratch that at the end uh, when I turn off the screen. Um, or just, you know, turn off your mic and, and pop in if you do have a pressing question. Um, and yeah. um, Peter, I could also monitor that. Okay, thank you. Appreciate that. You're okay that. with that, sure. Absolutely. I, I really think, you know, given that kind of combination of things, one, that this is, you know, I don't know how to categorize it. You know, like I said earlier, not quite new, but certainly new to a lot of people. Um, certainly interesting. And one of the real, I'd say, um, motivators behind a certain line of work that I've been focusing a lot on um, has been educating and advocacy because of, you know, combined with what we hear about with the Renaissance, there is a tremendous amount of misinformation, hype, uh, overly bloated expectations, and, and certainly in the substance or the addiction treatment space, you know, we learned a lot of lessons. We, we saw a wave of, you know, kind of Wild West, some um, questionable actors. So really want to make sure that we don't recreate a similar landscape with psychedelic medicine. Um, also, that being said, you know, I, I'm focusing on a specific lane, you know, the clinical and the medical application, the medicalization of it. That doesn't mean that's the only legitimate lane for psychedelic, psychedelic medicine. There are many others that are very legitimate. I'm only focusing on this one lane. Um, and lastly, I'll, I'll circle back because I realized I didn't mention, you know, what the flow initiative or, or really what my organization and then another organization that I'm affiliated with, which is Nushama, a clinic in Manhattan. But uh, the flow initiative really stemmed, like I said earlier, um, kind of out of that original disillusionment with that one size fits all kind of conventional approach to substance use treatment, addiction treatment, uh, and recognizing fairly early on in that treatment journey that it really does take a far more comprehensive and integrated approach than just solely focusing on the substance use disorders. And, and there was also kind of something that was going on concurrently within the substance use treatment space, which was, you know, almost as a space, we were becoming more isolated and, and, and siloed off from every other facet of healthcare and, and even more specifically mental health treatment in general, um, which also kind of further doubled down on that one size fits all approach. So really recognizing that that too, you know, it, it takes a very comprehensive approach. Um, nine out of 10 times, addiction's a symptom of a host of other things, you know, disease versus disorder, that could be a whole other topic of conversation. Uh, but simply put, you know, it, it's typically a symptom, not a problem. Um, and to isolate it from, you know, other forms of healthcare is really doing a disservice. So the flow initiative was just that, an initiative to create more of 
a collaborative landscape to treatment. Uh, fast forward was very fortunate to kind of be behind the first formation of a real medicalized addiction treatment program. First program set up uh, and founded by physicians. Um, and that's where I was first exposed to psychedelic medicine. Um, and we took a very comprehensive approach to medicine, therapy, psychology, experiential, spirituality, everything that would be part of that equation and how it all fit together. Um, and, you know, lo and behold, we weren't the only ones doing that by any means. Um, but we really see nowadays that that is kind of more of the gold standard. And um, so that's what the Flow Initiative is about. And coupled with that, as, as I mentioned, you know, or as I'm sure you, a lot of you have heard, you know, the term psychedelic renaissance, um, there's been a tremendous amount of interest, resurgence, and certainly funding. Um, a lot of startups, a lot of organizations, industries revolving around psychedelic therapy, psychedelic medicine, um, basically anything that could be monetized off of it. Um, and one thing that always interested me back to that clinical lane is, is Where's the evidence? Where's the research? Where is that basis that we could point to to say we are working off of an evidence basis? Um, and what was really fortunate, you know, and this is even going back in time to you know when we first started in this space is like I mentioned, you know, a lot of psychedelic medicine and original you know, research goes back decades. So there always was from, from the get-go, um, at least from modern application, an evidence basis. Um, but fast forward, especially post COVID um, and the real kind of ratcheting up FDA breakthrough status granted, um, other countries really coming in and supporting clinical trialing and research, the floodgates really opened up. Um, and so we've got a whole new landscape really of, of providers, clinics, uh, supply chain. And back to you know, that North Star of science, evidence basis, methodology, protocols. You know, I was always kind of looking for, you know, where is that, that package that, that we can kind of say, all right, now we've got a gold standard. And fortunately um, that was done overseas. In the UK, the UK government sponsored clinical trials with an organization called Awaken Life Sciences, uh, specifically studying ketamine and the use of ketamine for alcohol use disorder. Um, I'll get into some of the data behind that. But what they did is essentially through clinical trials established a, a, a model of incorporating psychedelic medicine and assisted therapy into a package and a protocol of approximately one month long, seven sessions, three infusion for alcohol use disorder. Um, they obviously had to choose one substance for the clinical trials, but there's now enough anecdotal and even empirical evidence through other trials that applicable for a host of other substances, uh, but found real efficacy with it. Uh, and that then really became established as a new model. Um, it's now entering phase three clinical trials. Uh, and Awaken Life Science was able to kind of package that protocol. Um, an organization, a clinic in the US licensed that protocol and made a commitment to kind of create the infrastructure to support it, the clinical training, the medical infrastructure and support staff, um, and brought that protocol to the US for alcohol use disorder. That is what brought me to them. And then that organization is called New Shama. It, it's essentially a psychedelic wellness clinic in Manhattan. And I'm their addic uh, director of addiction and recovery. Uh, so I have the Flow Initiative, which is a private practice and a clinic called New Shama, which I focus on their addiction and recovery program. So two ways in which I practice that way. And then I also do some consulting with some different organizations that are looking to integrate either psychedelic medicine into their program or even companies themselves that are looking to create more either mental health or recovery friendly workplaces. Um, so that's that in the intro, let's get going. Um, so just a quick sneak peek, just to kind of set a context. All of these little dots, they're all different examples. And I don't know if you can see in that lower right-hand corner, 
that legend is showing as you go inside closer to the bullseye you're getting into that bullseye is FDA approval. And you're kind of going up through the different phases of clinical trialing. So that outer ring, you know, is all, you know, entering in phase one, phase two, phase three. Um, as you go around, you're looking at the different substances and then all populated within those concentric rings are the different organizations sponsoring different clinical trials per respective substance. Um, so it's a pretty robust landscape of clinical trials, you know, sponsored research that's being done, you know, just to zoom in um, one little section to put it in perspective. So just wanted to give that sneak peek to put things in perspective that this is a pretty quickly maturing industry. Um, so it's not really, you know, that out there, not that alternative. Really, you know, the task at hand now is how do we further integrate it into existing healthcare systems, not how do we establish. Uh, so I think I kind of got into this a little bit. So let's get over this and let's just get right into the set or set it. So what is a psychedelic? It, it, it's kind of a tricky question, um, you know, and there, there's, I don't want to say controversy, but there's some talk around, you know, the, the name psychedelic. That term was coined, you know, back in the 60s by a, a psychiatrist looking to come up with the term. And, and, and don't quote me on all this etymology, but it had to do with Aldous Huxley, who was writing about it, and a kind of coterie evolving at that time of researchers, you know, counterculturalist and kind of intersecting and, and looking for a way to categorize. Uh, and so psychedelic as really almost a clinical term means mind manifesting. And, and that's really at the heart of it. And the reason why then we look at that aspect is because it really has to do with going within and entirely different mechanisms of operation than more conventional or traditional psychotropic medications. That being said, are psychedelics really about the substance or are they about the experience? You know, is it about that process of being able to mind manifest? And the reason why that's important to make the distinction of is because yes, when we're talking about psychedelics, we're, we're talking about substances, specifically psychedelic medicine compounds, uh, but then there's also a psychedelic state. Psychedelic states could be reached through any number of modes. You know. Meditation, breathing, holotropic breathing is one um, specific methodology that could put you in a psycholytic or a psychedelic state. Uh, and it really has to do with that state of mind that then allows one to then go within and go inside of the mind. And I'll get into you know, that mechanism of how we go inside of the mind in a moment, but it's that process that really differentiates psychedelics from other psychotropic medication. Um, the other interesting thing about psychedelics and, and as the research is, is, is showing more and more is it works on the hardware and on the software. So what are we talking about when we even start to talk about working on the brain? Back to, you know, neurologists, MDs can give a far more detailed overview than I can for obvious reasons. So take that with a grain of salt, but this is very top level. Um, but on the heart, I mean, I'm sorry, on the software, essentially what psychedelics do, uh, there's a host of different compounds and substances that you know, fall into that category of psychedelics, but what they kind of unanimously do in terms of the result is they shut down what's called the default mode network. That default mode network, is, as I'm sure a lot of you know, has to do with regions of the brain and how they communicate and how they interact and how default responses become encoded and embedded and essentially are being. And, and those default responses really take over in our unconscious and become very deeply encoded in our responses and our cognitive makeup. And that's what really initiates a lot of the ongoing and progressive nature of a lot of disorder, where then you know, things become more severe, more intense, more or back to progressive. 
so those mechanisms, you know, get further embedded and further coded. You know, we talk about defense mechanisms, rather specifically, you know, with regards to trauma and things like that would be one really good example. So what we see with psychedelic medicine and that psychedelic process is, is really and essentially a shutdown of that default mode network. So what that means is, is really a shutdown of what would ordinarily be our default mechanisms, typically our default defense mechanisms. Uh, when we look at what those mechanisms do, they're really the reconciliation between the brain's reconciliation between you know, a sensory experience and then the kind of emotional and cognitive processing of that experience. So what psychedelics, medicine, and the shutting down of that default network do is enable a little bit more space to happen or allow to exist as opposed to that default defense mechanism shutting right down. Um, and that's really at the heart of where the mechanics of psychedelic medicine work. Backing up for one sec, I should also put things in a, in a, in a greater context and back to some of the hype, the, the misinformation and kind of the cultural renaissance and movement and, and just hype around psychedelic. They're a tool. They are nothing more than a tool. They are not a cure-all. They're not a panacea or magic bullet. You hear cliches like, hey, in one psychedelic session, I could accomplish what took 10 years of therapy to do. That might have been the case, but that is not the proper context in which to set this up because back to what we're really doing, we're providing a lever, we're providing a tool to allow another process to happen. Uh, and in shutting down that default mode network and, and allowing that greater space to happen and systems within the brain to kind of reset and communicate and interact at a more optimum level, even you know, further research being looked into like blood flow, glucose level, all different you know, physiological responses that are going in the brain that are also indicative of optimal functioning. Um, so we're seeing that happen. And that then from that power tooling perspective you know, is where that I don't want to say magic, but that next level, that game-changing ability then opens up. And, and keeping the tool metaphor, I kind of like to expand on it, kind of like introducing electricity to tools. And we've had tools throughout history. We've had cities for millennia. Once we introduced electricity into tools, we then had power tools. You know, That's how we have tech, how we're doing what we're doing now. We look at, you know, I'm in New York City, look at our skyline, you know, inherently different over the last 50 years, um, you know, over the last, you know, few thousand years of having cities. But we're still using the same principles of engineering, architecture that have been around in a very similar way. That's kind of what we're doing with psychedelic medicine. You know, we're, we're power tooling that ability to shut down that default mode network, to allow a process in the brain to undergo that would then allow a lever to kind of open up opportunity for a whole host of other processes to follow. And it's through those processes that we achieve the results and the outcomes that we're looking for. Um, and that then is where that power tooling comes in. So we're able to kind of shut down that default response. We're able to create a little bit more space and in that is really where a lot of magic happens. Um, well, before I get into that, I'll, I'll continue here for a sec. Uh, and we're gonna jump around a little bit. So, so follow along with me, if you will. Take an individual, and this is kind of fast forwarding to a case study. And I'm just gonna illustrate a little bit what I talk about with that default mode network, you know, that space area. I'm sure, you know, a lot of clinicians here, people who've worked with, you know, acute patients, presenting suicidality, treatment resistant disorders, a lot of, you know, default mechanistic behavior going on that make meaningful engagement challenging, um, especially if there are things like suicidality, you know, heavy trauma responses where, 
you know, essentially what we've got to do is create a bridge to get through all of those barriers before we can even kind of get to the root of what is going to be that most effective treatment to kind of break down some of those defenses that you know, which serve real purpose. Um, what psychedelic allow us to do is get right to that, you know, through another, you know, kind of mechanism that happens, a disassociative mechanism. You know, so as one is able to kind of disassociate in some ways from back to those default, you know, mechanics, but also in some ways from a kind of quasi-conscious perspective, disassociate from themselves and also see themselves almost through a looking glass. Uh, um, their process and the context of what they're undergoing, it also provides a tremendous opportunity for an individual to gain tremendous insights and really tap into their own innate ability to kind of inner heal. And that then goes back to that definition of psychedelic at the heart, mind manifesting, where you know we're tapping into that innate ability. Uh, so just kind of moving along, there are a whole host of substances that you know fall under that category of psychedelics. I do wonder if five years from now there might be some other terms, you know, because when we look at, and this is just a short list. There, there are a number of other compounds that are on here. Even on this list, this list could be broken down into what are considered classic psychedelics, synthetic psychedelics, um, a whole new landscape on developing further synthetics, you know, um, and also the mode of operation. You know, are they working on serotonin receptors? Are they working on glutamate receptors? Uh, can vary. Um, but that being said, that process of what is then going on through that, you know, mecha those mechanics are kind of similar through the, these different substances. So you could read psilocybin, ketamine, MDMA, LSD, mescaline, ibogaine, ayahuasca, 5-MeO-DMT, all are in this category. Probably the, the few outliers right now we're going to hear more about especially in the coming years mdma in particular you know right now is poised for fda approval has gone through phase three clinical trials with maps public benefits corporation um i'll show you some data uh, on some future slides here uh ketamine is already approved um ketamine is on a short list of world health organizations essential meds uh, it's a battlefield anesthetic a disassociative anesthetic at that. Uh, but there was FDA approval granted for ketamine and an analog of ketamine, esketamine, uh, brand name Spravato, used for you know, a few different mental health disorders, treatment resistant depression, PTSD, and that's going back to 2018. Um, and then also is very commonly used off label, uh, not esketamine. Um, but whether it's IV, IM, sublingually, a lot of compound pharmacies now working on it. Um, so that is probably the most commonly applied and utilized uh, compound in the U.S. right now. And then psilocybin, close, you know, behind, but in some ways probably the most popular culturally. And we'll get into some of that in a moment also, but that, that's where you hear a lot of kind of derivative talk more specifically around microdosing, some interesting kind of um, legal machinations have happened more specifically around psilocybin. Uh, I'll also get into that in a, in a few moments. Um, and then, you know, just the, uh, I'd almost say like the pop culture or the cultural association and applications of psilocybin, LSD, um, even mescaline, MDMA, you know, also street name, you know, ecstasy, those kind of things also keep the popularity much further up. And then we hear more about ayahuasca, you know, in terms of retreats and people really utilizing it primarily for self-awareness um, and a more proactive betterment, um, usually done overseas. Uh, Ibogaine is a very, very fascinating compound 
from the Iboga root in Africa, but also going back to the 60s when it's first kind of developed, I'm gonna do a quick dive tangent here. Um, this individual found tremendous efficacy in the arrest of his heroin addiction and specifically the withdrawal process and thought there was a tremendous amount to that, wanted to sponsor research, uh, development of it. Started to initiate it, but then again, with that you know, war on drugs, uh, Nixon era got shut down, but there remain consistently from them, you know, different branches of whether they were underground or very kind of niche clinical trials or just practitioners continuing to utilize. Um, uh, landscape overseas of retreats and other providers. Um, and then closely following has been a whole host of data. And now also a lot of development on the synthetic side and delivery of Ibogaine. Um, and, you know, even fast forwarding now, one thing that, that's really exciting and, and really has um, kind of made a lot of ways is, is Kentucky. And, and if any of you are familiar with what Kentucky has done as a state with their opioid settlement money is they have um, allocated millions of dollars, I think it's $47 million um, to the research of Ibogaine for addiction treatment. Um, I am if we just stop and pause and think of the irony in that for a second, you know, Kentucky psychedelics. Uh, but if that doesn't illustrate and is that is an indicative of, you know, how much there really is to this when you look under the hood, as far as, you know, the robust body of evidence, uh, both empirical, anecdotal. Um, and then, you know, the context of the current treatment isn't working. You know, the results that we see just are not acceptable anywhere else in healthcare. So it's really exciting to see, you know, what is happening now and, and things that were so far in the fringes are now coming into the forefront. 5-MeO-DMT um, is another example of that. Yeah. First associated with like literally licking, you know, a gland off of a toad. Um, but then, you know, those compounds develop, you know, after further seeing the efficacy of it um, and tremendous amount of research being put into that and, and efficacy also. So it's a really exciting time and so much more that could be unpacked with these. I, I would encourage everybody you know, spend a little time learning a little bit more about the different substances, how they work. Um, gets a little too granular to get into right here. We, we just lose too much time and go down too many rabbit holes. So I'll just keep moving along. Um, part two, we get into like the actual healing journey, which, which I touched on a little bit earlier. Um, but also in a, a little harder here in this format to kind of get more interactive, but you know, what exposure have some of you had? Um, what do you know, you know when you hear about psychedelic assisted therapy, psychedelic healing? You know, and back to, you know, a pretty varied landscape from retreats to kind of just do it yourself to very established clinical practices. Um, and all almost equally as trending and as popular. Um, one really, I'd say, interesting aperture that, that exemplifies a lot of this is microdosing. So kind of micro versus macro dosing just as its own topic is an interesting issue. The reason I'm also kind of just pointing this out is because I'm gonna bring it up and then park it. Uh, micro dosing is a topic that there's still a lot more jury out and still a lot more research that needs to be done to include it in the same context of what we're talking about with more generalized psychedelic assisted therapy. Uh, the other challenge with microdosing is when microdosing was first established as a protocol, it was very specific in the protocoling of, you know, for example, with a specific substance at a specific fractional dose of what was recognized as a therapeutic dosage under a specific time frame with a specific frequency. Very, very clear cut. 99% of microdosing being done now, talked about now, are more you know popular cultures and, and anecdotal. 
by the way, that statistic from my experience is, you know, are people talking about, I'm doing this, this is what I'm doing. I, I'm taking, you know, my own fraction of a dose of what I know is this illicit substance and I'm just taking it every day. Uh, that, yes, you, you are microscopically dosing a compound but and micro dosing, but that is not what was originally kind of introduced as a concept. The, the whole, as we talk about it now, concept of microdosing is, is very diluted, very, you know, kind of grayed up and murky. So going to leave it to the side for now. Is there efficacy behind it? Most likely, I believe so. Enough evidence indicates so. Um, but back to the kind of challenges between the different compounds, the different protocols and methodology, um, it just becomes a little more challenging to categorize as generally as we can with, with psychedelic assisted therapy proper. Uh, also, I should also kind of digress into a greater context of psychedelic medicine, which, which I, I'm remiss to not bring up earlier, which is one of the other real key differentiations between psychedelic medicine and other psychotropics and kind of goes back to that power tool analogy metaphor used earlier is what psychedelics really do. And one of the things that's so tremendously exciting, uh, you know, it allows us to really get to the root of disorder, dysfunction, disease, not just mitigating the symptoms. And when we really look at what the majority of, whether it's psychotropic medications or the majority of what a lot of the therapeutic process that we work around uh, is kind of designed to do, it's, it, it, it's to mitigate symptoms, not really you know, address the underlying root. Uh, and there are many, many instances that's, that's too difficult, you know, too heavy of a lift, too challenging, too complex. Uh, but that is at the heart of what psychedelic medicine is all about. And, and back to like, you know, going within, it, it allows you to get into that deeper root. And why that's also an important distinction, especially within the context of micro versus macro dose, is for the most part, and again, generalization, micro dosing as is practiced in the overwhelming majority of time even with the intention that it's set out to do so, really falls more within that context of symptom mitigation than you know, addressing the root disorder. Uh, and what you hear people talk about when they talk about microdosing and the intentions and the outcome are kind of more along the lines of that, them you know, undergoing a real sense of profound transformational change. Um, and so another big differentiation between microdosing versus in a, what would be more of the psychedelic journey and experience. Um, so also kind of moving along, oh, as I mentioned, you know, Western medicine has been focusing on psychedelics for you know, the better part of 60 years. Uh, but we'd be tremendously remiss in that acknowledging the different historical, cultural, indigenous practices, utilizations, tremendous amount of discovery and knowledge, uh, and even establishment of protocols and practices that we've piggybacked on today. Um, and, and how do we integrate all of that? You know, as much as you know, we want to medicalize and, and come up with best practices, there also has to be some context of inclusivity and acknowledgement to, you know, that parallel process of, you know, this machine that's also gone on for far longer than we've even had the, this, this construct of Western medicine. And how do we keep that in, you know, the proper context? Um, what does the science tell us you know, also? And why is that so important to have an evidence basis where especially with that landscape that we saw with addiction treatment, we still see you know, where it's so easy to, you know, make almost charlatan-esque like promises, set expectations, um, 
you know, coupled with the really unfortunate reality that for the most part, mental health treatment is a do-it-yourself endeavor. So uh, why do we want the blind leading the blind? Um, we really need an evidence basis, an establishment of best practices, gold standard to help guide us. Not to necessarily say one way is the only way, but to help just inform us of, of you know, back to best practices, standardizations, um, lessons being used. And so back to the importance of utilizing science, really establishing more of this clinical lane and channel. Um, Acknowledging that there will always be other lanes and channels that are just as valid. Um, but that being said, we really need to further establish this clinical channel. Um, and it is being done. Uh, then we're going to get into the next set. When we talk about psychedelic assisted therapy, what are we even talking about? And, and I mentioned process modalities but what are we talking about you know we've all probably been exposed to psychedelic you know in a cultural context maybe even seen some of the michael pollan episodes or you know new netflix special even called the pollen effect uh or, or part of this uh, renaissance um but what are we really talking about we're talking about essentially a three-step process there's preparation the actual medication, and then integration. The reason it's a three-step process is because when we're talking about this kind of clinical lane, it's never about the medication itself. Uh, back to the medication is just a tool. You know, A tool is never the solution in itself. It's how it's wielded and in what context and to achieve what pre-established outcome and objective. Um, the reason I'm really illustrating it and then backing up to kind of put it back in that context of science uh, now with this really robust crop of evidence, research, trialing that's gone on, we've got a very clear narrative and very clear picture of what that science has told us. And it very clearly states that integration is key. There isn't just one way to integrate, many, many ways in which you can integrate but the process of therapeutically integrating that psychedelic experience into you know, ongoing and everyday life is, it's almost like the hardener in you know, epoxy or resin. Without that, it won't gel. Um, it's not to say without integration, there's no benefits to psychedelics. I can't necessarily say that. But what I can say is the evidence, the research overwhelmingly points to the fact that with that three-step process, there's a profound difference in measurable outcomes when integration is part of that process. Um, and back to mentioned earlier on, psychedelics work on the software and on the hardware. Another Really incredibly exciting aspect of psychedelic is what it does on the hardware of the brain for the hardware of the brain. Back to talking about how like psychedelic, almost simply put, let the brain optimize. Really, if we think about the brain as like a computer system, motherboard on this, this, this laptop in front of me with different systems communicating to operate most efficiently and effectively, all of our brains are basically like obsolete very bugged up iOS systems that have viruses, have bugs, you know, all kinds of things going on. But yet, you know, the hardware might be very functional, but things just aren't fully jiving. By kind of doing a software overhaul or software update, we can have just that, the software run more functionally, but then also the hardware is going to then run far more efficiently, effectively, as the software is running better. Similarly, that's what happens with the brain. You know, when we talk about different systems communicating, firing better, what we're really talking about at, at the root is what's going on on a synapsis level, dendrite, you know, all of those different things. And, and we're seeing 
real things, real changes, and then measurable changes along, you know, neuroplasticity, you know, synopsis repair. You can measure it in functional MRIs. I'll show you some data in a moment. Uh, but that also really illustrates where that integration process supports that neurogenesis, that plasticity, which goes on after just that medication experience happens. Um, so what that software reboot overhaul then allows to kind of catalyze on the hardware level is also you know, profound. Um, so back to why integration and having a process is so key. And, and, and that's really what drew me to getting into a clinic like Nushama was they very early on uh, established that intention and the clarity of, you know, as opposed to a lot of other uh, providers out there, we're following the science, we're developing you know, the protocols to have these processes in place. Um, recognize it's not just the medication, it's just a part of it. Uh, so it's, it's exciting to see how things are really establishing more. Um, reason why it's also important to point out is because now that there are also far more providers and that kind of spectrum of how the delivery of you know, services are, are being provided, we want to be more informed, more aware of, well, how are they doing it? And, you know, there are a number of different types of clinics. You hear things like drip clinic. You know, you'll see anything from on an IV level where somebody can go into a clinic, be hooked up to an IV by even a nurse practitioner and left alone. And then kind of once they're recovered after the infusion and after the experience, which might only be about an hour, 90 minutes, you know, and then stabilized and recovered. Okay, see ya. And it back to that DIY. As opposed to, you know, that process that's really kind of established around, well, before we even give a medication, let's do a real preparation session. And even backing up, before we even deem an individual an appropriate candidate for any of these, these practices, we also have to rule out any uh, comorbidities or contraindications, which there are some. Um, cardiac issues, probably the number one, um, history of psychosis, not only in an individual, but um, nuclear family, you know, things like that could rule an individual out. Psilocybin works on the serotonin 2A receptors. So for many, you know, commonly there, there's always been talk about if somebody is then on an SSRI, are they not a candidate for, you know, psilocybin treatment? There's more and more research being done now that's calling that into question. So kind of leave that jury out and leave that for other MDs and other researchers. Um, but the real major um, contraindications are cardiac and history of psychosis. Uh, so once somebody is deemed an appropriate candidate, before we even begin you know, any medication or journey session, going through a preparation process is also so key. Setting intentions, uh, making sure other procedural elements are in place, uh, set and setting. Words you might've heard before, what, what does that mean? The mindset that one has and the environmental conditions that one is kind of around. We hear things like bad trip, right? Back to the data, back to the research, both anecdotal and empirical. Nine out of 10 times, even more by the empirical numbers. Um, bad trips are associated directly with set and setting, the mindset somebody was in and the environmental conditions. So for example, you know, somebody's at a party, at a rave, they take a, a, a psychedelic substance, they're triggered back to a traumatic experience and they're not within, you know, A, the mindset or the, any kind of therapeutic context. It might be the opposite, you know, potentially triggering environment that's gonna potentially precipitate other adverse reactions without any control factors or guidance that can help maintain you know, a clearer trajectory through this process. Um, that being said, challenging experiences you know, are commonly a part of it, but 
but those challenging experiences can be where the growth happens, just as in any other aspect of therapy. Uh, so creating that proper set and setting for an individual, one that is conducive to that individual, how do you understand what would be that conducive mindset for one to be in, to be able to set intentions that would be meaningful and effective to achieve a desired outcome? Um, what would be the conducive environment that would also promote and facilitate that? Um, even examples like, you know, do you put a blindfold on? Music, uh, certainly the room and environment. Uh, all those different things have an impact. Um, so very important to have in context. And back to, you know, that integration being, you know, probably the number one factor and, you know, the overall data and efficacy, you know, is a proper process and modality being followed. Set and setting is probably the, the next, if not other most critical variable. Um, so, so goes without saying that a proper therapeutic context is certainly a conducive setting. Um, but back to why, you know, things like this are more necessary because we need more education and training to be able to facilitate those conducive environments, um, clinical training on, on how do we properly guide clinical training and how do you properly and effectively integrate, uh, much different processes than a lot of other modalities of therapy, um, so a lot goes into it. If anybody has any questions, uh, feel free to pipe in as we're going along. Uh, uh, here's an example of some of that research I was showing. Um, so this comes from uh, MAPS, which is the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Science. Uh, to just kind of tangent, digress for a second here. A month ago, uh, I was out at the MAPS conference in Denver, Colorado. Uh, it's the fourth conference they've held. Um, going back a number of years, obviously COVID put a damper on things for a number of years. The last conference was 2017. I think in 2017, they might've had a 2,000 people or so. In Denver last month, there were 13,000 people, um, primarily clinicians. Uh, so really also exciting times and indicative of, of what an impact and what a landscape is really evolving. Uh, so MAPS has really been a leader in the development of the clinical lane and uh, real institutional research and funding and programming around psychedelic medicine. Uh, Rick Doblin, who was the founder 35 years ago, amazing story. Um, I highly recommend everybody look that up a bit. Uh, so MAPS spun off, you know, a, a public benefits corporation to further develop MDMA as a compound, as a drug that could then get FDA approval and then be utilized. Uh, what's really exciting is backing up to that context of you know, therapy modeling is this is the first time and the FDA has already drafted some of the language for the approval. Uh, this is the first time that FDA approval will be conditional upon an individual being actively engaged in a therapeutic process in order to be prescribed this medication. Very telling. Don't even have that with a benzo. And you really think about what a powerful medication that is. Um, so here's you know, what is a real seminal study for, you know, MDMA, phase three clinical trial, uh, MDMA for PTSD treatment. And when we really look at PTSD being kind of a hairbinger of uh, you know, interest, research, and kind of flywheeling of psychedelic medicine for obvious reasons, you know, this day and age coming out of an incredible cadence of military action, tremendous political, social, unrest, we're a very traumatized society. Uh, even more specifically, when we look at some of the data and even further tragedies that are going on within our veterans populations and has been now for the better part of 20 years, it really is just mind boggling when we see those numbers, you know, how many vets are committing suicide every day. Uh, 
so, so really understanding PTSD and effective treatments is of tremendous importance. Um, and then looking at what veterans groups, the VA and other groups have really done to advocate, promote and endorse treatment um, and really break down walls and, and kind of make this a, a cross aisle issue. By the way, I should mention uh, Rick Perry was one of the opening speakers for the conference. Um, AOC, who is probably one of the most liberal progressive Democrats in collaboration with Rand Paul, one of the most conservative, you know, hardline Republicans, have co-sponsored legislation, you know, to fast track psychedelic study. Um, so we really see it taking hold specifically around PTSD treatment, veterans, um, and how do we effectively look at that? So this study on the outset showed with MDMA assisted psychotherapy pretty much doubled the efficacy. Here's the most exciting part. 12 months after, we then saw, they then saw a pretty marked jump significant increase in efficacy, where now 68% no longer met diagnostic criteria. What is that indicative of? That, 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 that neuroplasticity, um, that's the neurogenesis we were talking about. Uh, the real hardware change, the hardware improvements. Uh, so, so real sustainable transformational change is possible. Um, very, very exciting, um, but again, very illustrative uh, and indicative of the importance of process and context of therapy, modeling, best standard, evidence basis being utilized. Back to integration is key. You know, what is it? How does it work? Um, what is it? Kind of everything and nothing at the same time. Uh, because it, it really is what is going to be the most conducive form of integration for that individual. In this context, we're talking most specifically about therapeutic integration, I guess even more specifically clinically therapeutic integration. Um, and even that can undergo a number of different kind of forms from conventional psychotherapy to maybe experiential therapy, and maybe it's not even clinical therapy. Maybe it's their forms of coaching. Maybe it's a spiritual process, but it's some defined process that has a clearly established intention and process and plan that is then going to kind of bridge and integrate that experience, that journey that one underwent with the psychedelic medicine into their ongoing life. So for example, you know, when somebody was in the journey, you know, one thing that might be common would be, I had a vision, I was able to see this, uh, I had an insight into a specific perspective. Um, how do you continue to engage that? Create more space around whatever it is that comes up. That's integration at the heart, is recognizing what are those issues? How do we focus more on them? And how do we then incorporate that into an ongoing plan and framework? Um, so cannot stress enough how important an integration process and a greater framework of therapy you know, is, is really necessary for effective psych psychedelic medicine. And again, I'm, I'm framing it around medicine. Um, so the landscape, what is this landscape that we're talking about? Um, obviously we've got the legal versus illegal. I, I mentioned before, you know, we're focusing here on, on the channel of medicine, clinical treatment, um, but we've got, you know, a pretty wide rest of the pie where that's just one slice. Uh, ceremonial, even recreational. Um, I'm not one to judge, uh, but just talking about the clinical landscape, we're also kind of 
inherent having to, to recognize those others because of how things are being recategorized, rescheduled. Uh, Colorado, Oregon, outliers right now. I'll get into them in a moment, you know, from whether or not it's, it's decriminalizing, legalizing, creating an infrastructure and framework to provide therapy, although there still is, you know, a juxtaposition between what's legal on a state level and, you know, supersedingly illegal on a federal level, um, which creates its own challenges. And then a number of states have pending um, legislation to what might be done um, to either decriminalize, legalize, uh, establish, you know, channels and infrastructure to provide treatment. Uh, so a pretty wide, varied landscape. But focusing on this medicalized therapeutic lane that we're talking about, an even more established landscape within that lane. And from that, there's even a spectrum from, I mentioned earlier on, you know, you have clinics within clinics, kind of their own spectrum. Then you've got, they might be retreats, many of which which are overseas in other countries, again, for obvious reason. You've got a, a whole host of individual providers. Um, a new landscape of, as is kind of the rest of the world, kind of like direct to consumer, utilizing tech, virtual technology, um, kind of a hybrid approach of where a number of different, they're not even startups at this point, um, you can kind of engage in this process where you can do a, um, a virtual medieval with a physician, um, get medical approval and prescription and be mailed like a sublingual dosage. There are a few organizations that will do that, allow the person to then journey on themselves. I've already kind of talked about why I highly or I do not endorse that. I'll leave it at that. To you know, organizations that might work that way, but in conjunction with a coterie of licensed therapists that that is an inherent part of their model that they might do the prescribing, but the journeying and the process is then undergone with a licensed clinician who will then oversee um, either the experience and or the ongoing integration process, hopefully both. Um, two individual providers who kind of are doing things underground and utilizing you know, other medications like MDMA, psilocybin, which still are illegal. Uh, and they're even licensed, you know, I know a few MDs, PhDs, you know, highly respected providers. Um, I'm not going to judge. It's unfortunate that, you know, we're still in a circumstance that that has to be done. But um, now that there is more of that established channel of providers that we have an established set of best practices and standards, a model of, you know, gold standardization that now exists, highly recommend that is what becomes the default. Um, Lastly, you know, we've got a lot of stigmatization. Um, real specifically, when we get into addiction treatment, um, where there is, you know, concurrently a tremendous amount of interest, clinical trialing, research being done around, and looked into around, you know, psychedelic medicine for addiction or substance use disorder. When we look at it from, you know, a population standpoint and population of treatment providers, interestingly, you know, there's almost more internal stigmatization and resistance than there is externally. But even externally, we still have a lot of stigmatization association with the countercultural aspects, uh, the recreational. Um, and so, how do we destigmatize? How do we create more of that lane of medicalization? Um, and it's through more of this. It's through the establishment of more best practices, more standards, um, more providers. Uh, and then, you know, lastly, the outcomes, which really speak and endorse more than anything else. You know, when you've got an individual who was on the brink of suicidality, you know, 
treatment resistant, bouncing in and out of facility to facility, but then undergoes the, this type of process and such profound transformational change. And they're going back to their respective communities. You know, what an impact that has. And also mind you, you know, not only these mental health issues are only about an individual. These are ecosystem issues. They impact whoever the stakeholders are around that individual, family, professional, community. And then we're also looking at, you know, intergenerationally what's going on. So by really, you know, affecting this level of change, we're having tremendous impact and ripple effects. Uh, and that also is going to be probably one of the largest levers around destigmatization. Veterans, you know, a shining example of, you know, the VA has absolutely led the charge and has probably been the single largest catalyst in making this in a, a bipartisan issue. Uh, so exciting. It was what I was talking about earlier, you know, Oregon, you know, ORS 475, um, really has established a real framework to completely legalize psilocybin. You know, they're gonna have dispensaries, you know, all kinds of stuff. Um, Colorado approved Proposition 122. It's gonna take a few years for everything to still roll out, um, establishing more of a framework as is other states to, you know, how do you decriminalize, legalize, and then at the same time create an infrastructure and regulatory body around provision of medical services from training of clinicians. Um, but again, you know, you've got this dichotomy of, you know, legalized state level, but, you know, supersedingly illegal and, and classified on a federal level. Um, so a lot of grinding. But another thing that's really exciting on the landscape is the California Treat Initiative. Just want to spend a moment talking about that because I, I really believe that that is a blueprint that might roll out for the rest of the country. Um, the physician behind the TREAT initiative in California, um, Jeannie Fontana, she's the doc who basically is responsible for the stem cell research that we know of today. When Bush put a moratorium on research, 92, 93, whatever that was, she had the foresight and vision to see like, wait, A, you know, this is so necessary. We cannot, you know, grind, you know, the wheels on, on all the progress that we're making. So how do we keep, you know, the gears rolling. Um, all right, in California, there's a ballot initiative that we can do. And through that ballot initiative, if we're able to approve state funding, what would that flywheel and what would that then cascade? You know, history showed us what it did and what an effective blueprint that was uh, to essentially, you know, create a ballot initiative and a proposition to fund on a state level, or, you know, in that case, stem cell research and then create an infrastructure to then regulate and oversee, which then, you know, kind of flywheeled for the rest of the world and country. Um, it's exactly what's being done now with psychedelic medicine. Uh, it's an initiative underway that they're currently getting the signatures necessary to get the ballot initiative. And then it really looks like that would be the blueprint where, um, Jeannie uses a brilliant analogy where, you know, back to the like Oregon and Colorado and some of the other, you know, pending legislation, you know, it's kind of like teaching a nine-year-old to drive in a parking lot. You probably can do it well, and they can probably do pretty well in, in that highly confined area, but then getting out on the roads, especially integrating with, you know, the rest of society, that's where you really hit all the complications. And and challenges. And that's where I think there, there's a lot of similarities. So we really need a whole lot more, a lot more complexities, um, a lot more than just the legal aspect, but really, you know, the regulatory, the compliance, the educational, um, the funding uh, is so critical to take that far more comprehensive blueprint. Uh, so that's why that then is very exciting and looks to be hopefully the blueprint that might kind of follow for the rest of the country. Um, but I forget how many states currently right now have different uh, pending legislation on the books. New York is one. Um, for example, here are some specific examples of uh, different medications that are in 
you know, clinical trials versus, like I mentioned earlier, ketamine is legal. Uh, Off-label for mood disorders other than S-ketamine, which is, you know, like I mentioned, an analog of ketamine, which is actually FDA approved. This is that bullseye chart I showed you earlier, which also, you know, just helps from a population perspective, just see the scale. Um, by the way, uh, I'll put up my email at the end of this, uh, and I believe this is being recorded. So, uh, you know, if you want an actual copy of this or any other resources, just feel free to contact me and I'm happy to share, you know. Uh, back to challenges and contradictions. You know, what is a bad trip? I, I kind of mentioned that earlier. Um, Kind of talked about some of this on an interest of time, I want to keep going. Uh, but should mention, you know, there is also talk back to some of the hype. Uh, addiction's a very complex thing, you know. Uh, a lot of chatter around psychedelics aren't addictive, very safe. Okay, they are. There isn't the same potential for chemical dependency as there is for other substances, but there certainly is a potential for psychological, other maladaptions and other dependencies around different compounds. So definitely something to be very mindful of, you know, and, and be cautious around, uh, especially, you know, when we look at things like microdosing and, and other applications that people are then utilizing or kind of DIYing. Um, so there is some concern and there is some potential for the overutilization, or, you know, especially with vulnerable populations. Um, so back to the real need for the establishment of evidence basis, standards, modeling, and all of that. Um, some myth busting, you know, there's a lot out there. I think I covered some of them, um, kind of like, uh, you know, you'll undergo in one trip what might've taken 10 years of therapy, uh, not addictive. Um, they're all the same. So th those are the most common one. Uh, so a case study, uh, just in the interest of time, I'm just gonna blow through a real quick one. Quinn, this was actually one of my first patients um, with uh, the agency I worked with uh, back in 2017, the recovery spot in Manhattan with those docs and uh, referred to us by an organization through uh, while Cornell, Columbia Presbyterian, um, it was a headstrong project that worked with special operators. Um, and this Navy SEAL uh, displayed such treatment resistance that you know, even the most qualified, credentialed, highly respected clinician that the most highly respected institution got exasperated and just hit a wall. Like, you know, we, we, there's just not much else we can do. And then even with what we can do, we're looking at such a long runway, you know, before we can even meaningfully engage, you know, such intense suicidality, such treatment resistance. So what would be most likely, you know, okay commit to inpatient care, maybe undergo ECT, you might be looking at, you know, hopefully meaningfully engaging six weeks out, a month out, and we'll go from there. This gentleman came in and um, did the eval with the docs, uh, did a preparation session, we did some tension setting, uh, underwent an IV ketamine session, then underwent integration. Um, that afternoon we were meaningfully engaging that gentleman suicidality was reversed. The family uh, was engaged. Uh, I just had, and this was back in 2017. I just had lunch with him last month. Um, he talks about, you know, the utter transformational change that, and he had undergone about 20 treatment episodes prior to that. You know, that was just unlike anything else. Um, and also, very much credited, not just the medication, but the process, the medication, the journey itself. And he was really able to kind of dichotomize and uncouple what was able 
to be gained as far as insights, you know, certain perspectives from that disassociation, but then also take and process and work through, integrate essentially therapeutically over time, which was able to then rewrite the narrative you know, that he held. And that narrative you know, is what, when we talk about PTSD and trauma-related disorders, is what all those things revolve around. You know, so by you know establishing you know kind of a new playing field, a new medium to now create a new narrative. Like I mentioned earlier, you know that default mode network. That's the narrative. You know, I'm a failure. This will happen. This could never be. Um, this will never work. You know, those things are shut down. Um, Maybe I can, I can love myself. I can believe, I can have hope. Uh, those things on a real unconscious level, when we look at things like, you know, at the core, you know, 101 self-efficacy, you know, it's easy to take for granted when that is so foundationally removed. Um, but how profound it is when again, like a power tool that is able to be kind of reintroduced. Um, then what you're able to do on such a game-changing level with that new playing field is really so meaningful and profound. And that epitomizes in many ways what psychedelic therapy and medicine is all about. You know, it's creating that window of opportunity to really get in, use that power tool to really meaningfully engage, understand what are we even dealing with at the root of disorder, dysfunction, maladaption? Uh, how does that intertwine? How did that go into creating the narrative that the individual is suffering from? And now by utilizing that power tool, giving that lever to shut that down, to create that space from you know, the kind of the sensory, the event to the emotion, the cognition, and, and shutting down those defaults. Now we've got you know that lever to get in, go under the hood, you know, do some of those things. So you know, like how a lot of your clinicians, you know, probably utilizing things, you know, the different behavioral therapies, IFS, somatic experiences, whatever it is. When we integrate all of those different things in, what we're able again, like a power tool, utilize with that lever that's already been enacted. It's kind of like, which is maybe an, an overarching analogy metaphor. I'm just being mindful of time to maybe wrap it up. And a, a giant boulder you know, on the top of a hill, that giant boulder is, is the presenting problem. And we're trying to constantly you know, get that lever, push it, get it to roll down the hill. Um, or, you know, maybe a lot of the therapy is about just removing the pressure that that boulder is enacting on the surface of the hill. That's back to that symptom mitigation. What psychedelic medicine allows us to do is provide that lever to get the boulder rolling. The integration process, the neuroplasticity, is the boulder rolling itself. The transformational change is the momentum that's built and then maintained. Um, so kind of back to the context, psychedelic medicine is a catalyst. It's, it's a tool to catalyze greater change. It's that lever that'll get the ball rolling. Those case studies, um, there are many, many more. Uh, I highly recommend everybody or encourage everybody to um, Reach out to me, email me if you'd like any more. Here's my email. Um, that is my website for the Flow Initiative. Uh, the clinic in Manhattan is called New Shama, um, N U S H A M A. Uh, but if you have any questions, even if you just want to chat to learn more, um, as I mentioned, this is a real kind of personal meets professional intersection of mine. So I really kind of have two sense of you know, need to to talk more about this. The doors are open to all of you. Um, there's a tremendous amount of data out there. I'm happy to provide it. Encourage you all to do more research. Um, 
and I'll leave it at that. Anybody has any questions? We've got a few minutes left. Uh, wasn't expecting to go this long, so apologies if there isn't enough time, but I'll open it up. Are you able to see the chats? I'm seeing a lot coming through. Oh, no, um, not sorry. I stop sharing the screen then. Um, let's see. Very informative, fascinating. Thank you so much. Thank you. So I don't see any questions. <laughs> well, you're welcome. And, and thank you to everybody who's taught me. Um, and uh, feel free. Um, is there any other research can point us to? Uh, a great source for research is um, two different areas. One, maps as an organization. Um, and then, so maps.org, I believe it is. Um, they have a whole section on research. Um, and then there's Psychedelic Alpha, which is another site that has a tremendous amount of, you know, kind of collated research and data. Um, uh, and again, you know, feel free to email me, reach out, contact, call, however is best for you. I'm uh, happy to provide any other, um, or if there's specific things you'd like, specific studies for, um, what's pretty exciting, uh, you know, now there is a pretty robust and a really nuanced body of evidence for, you know, any number of different things. Okay. Anybody, any further questions, feel free to just unmute yourselves. There are also, you know, should mention some really exciting, you know, in terms of like even just doing some other research, top level Googling illustrations um, that um, really show like functional MRIs, things that very clearly illustrate much more effectively than can do in a format like this. Um, some of the modes of operation, how different psychedelic compounds work. Um, so seeing that could be also very informative. Again, MAP, Psychedelic Alpha, two great sources for a lot of different examples of research or specific studies, links, and so forth. Did that answer your question, Hannah? Uh, Hannah's out, yep, it did. <laughs> Anything else? Well, thank you, Peter. Certainly appreciate all this information. It's good to know that this is on uh, on more of a, I can't say a, it's more of a positive trajectory, it sounds like. So that's good news. It is. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I do see a question here that, that I should address. How many treatments to get to conclusion? That's an excellent question. And I apologize. I'm remiss in not having brought that up. It varies. Um, very individualized. Um, you know, some of the seminal studies were done on a single dose. Um, ketamine, more data points towards more frequent sessions. Um, and at the same time, potential for the need for potential boostings maybe. So a bit of a spectrum, but enough data and evidence for enough applications that there is potentially a single dose efficacy. And then again, depending on the individual, what is being done, what you know, the desired outcome is, it could be a few. Overall, as a whole, we're not talking about a very long-term intensive ongoing process. So even within that spectrum, we're talking about either single dose to maybe, you know, like with ketamine, where there are multiple, probably an average might be six to eight sessions. So I hope that answered that question. And again, you know, more research that would point to different compounds and, and different kind of dosing schedules and long-term efficacy. Um, I see, I think it was Elia was asking if we, if you guys can get a copy of this. Yes. Uh, once, give us a, to the end of this week, to the beginning of next week. And Margot works on that and she'll be able to get that to you. Just send me an email and I'll forward it. 
And there's one more. Um, somebody just said, thank you, I'm sold. Hannah. <laughs> <laughs> You know, and it's kind of, well, thank you all for coming. And, and just a little anecdote, right? I had to be sold, you know, as a person in recovery myself, back to that time frame, you know, my training, my, my you know, ethos was you know, eh, kind of this replacement, you know, questionable, but in seeing the results and in seeing the evidence and data, just that I was sold. Um, and, and as time has gone on and just more and more ha, has further populated that further so. Um, so so thank you all for, for taking the time to come, wanting to learn. Um, if you have any clients, you know, people who are interested, you can always send them my way. I'm not for everybody, but I can also help maybe point them in the right direction or collaborate with you very much believe in collaboration. It's gonna take a village and um, thank you all. And thank you um, to the Root Center for, for really being a leader in this space. And I really appreciate that.